Um, a few, uh, a quick update on, uh, before we, we call it a quick update on, uh, on the social uh, networking conversations, which I, I, li I like to show. So if we could have uh, the slides up from uh, Data Sift and, uh, and Tableau. Here we go. We got 22,000 social conversations. You can see uh, in, uh, in, in, in light blue, you can see the uh, conversations around the world outside of the room and in dark blue inside the room, uh, attending locally or not, that's what I meant, and also the tags, so of course sharing economy, again, that's kind of the same, but uh, very, very consistent, lots of tweeting, it's, it's pretty close to uh, uh, what we had in Paris. Um, you are the most popular speakers from day two, Mark Suster and Axel Tessandier about the digital hippies, Axel is right here, and uh, Chris Guillebeau, so uh, lots, lots of buzz. You can see the, on the right their names uh, by number of tweets and sentiment. That's for real-time real -time sentiment analysis. The most shared links, CNN, that has put the web on the front page, not even of CNN Europe, but CNN.com, so thanks CNN for doing that. Editors speak, and they do a daily wrap. Uh, and then Jeremiah, again, again, who completely hacked the web this year, <laughs> and all the live sketching, which, which I love. So uh, this is awesome. And then, uh, very interesting, the startup competition, which is coming next, the finals. My permissions is the most mentioned positively. And then you can see all the other startups which have been uh, the most uh, uh, quoted positively on social networks. And I, I will keep the, uh, the teasing up on the three finalists on the 16 from the 350 who, were, who applied. Uh, but, um, I'm happy, well, we'll talk about it later. Uh, next is, um, is uh, our friend Lily Cole, who is uh, an actress, an activist, and a social entrepreneur. Uh, we met a few times, and uh, uh, she started announcing Impossible.com in, in, um, in Davos with uh, uh, Jimmy Wells and with Mohamed Yunus. And um, uh, she is going to do one of the very first showings of Impossible.com here at Le Web London. Lily, Lily Cole. I'm so glad you made it. I'm so glad to be here, thank you. How are you doing? Very good. Please. Hello, everyone. Um, it's a great pleasure to join you in this sharing economy conference. I, uh, I just flew in this morning, actually, and on my flight this morning, I was stuck. It's just an anecdote that I thought was quite appropriate to what we're doing. Um, I was stuck in the corridor, you know, when you're waiting to get off the plane. And this woman kept trying to get behind a few of us to get to her bags a few seats back. And she kept jamming into us, jamming into us, trying to get around us. And eventually, the American guy behind me said, whoa, whoa, lady, lady, why don't you just ask our help? And picked up her bags, gave them to her. And he said, you know, it's, it's interesting how far a cooperation can go. Um, it goes a long way, and then you don't have to run over me. So I'm here to talk about a little bit about cooperation and what we're trying to do with impossible.com. Uh, before I start, uh, there's a um, little short film that was given as a gift to us that I thought I'd show you because it speaks to the idea. So what is impossible? Impossible is a social network that's trying to encourage people to do things for each other for free. Why would people <laughs> just do things for no money? I found in my life the things that are done for free, um, the generosity of people around me, and me being generous has been some of the happiest experiences I've ever had. How exactly does the app help you do that? What we do is we um, let you wish, and then the wishes are shown to people who are likely to be able to help you. Say you need advice on something or you want a piano lesson. The examples are endless, and um, imagine if... There was a way that you could communicate what you need and lo and behold, somebody might turn up and actually do it. Why did you call this impossible? Because a lot of people think it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. And um, it's a riff on I'm possible because it depends on people. And I really believe in people. Like, I believe we can make it real if people want to make it real. It's up to us. So. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'll say thanks on behalf of the three people who gave their time to make that. Um, so the idea is incredibly simple. It's essentially the idea of giving, and I find it almost ridiculous that I have to try and explain or justify it. Um, 
But to be clear, it's distinct from exchange. A lot of people, when I, when I kind of talk about this idea, immediately go to barter and think, I think, of kind of old marketplaces and, um, <laughs> and the idea of exchanging goats and cattle. Uh, gift is quite distinct from exchange. For me, the idea is you're kind of bartering with the collective. There's an implicit sense of trust in that. There's generalized reciprocity, which means you give to somebody because somebody else might give back to you. It might be the same person, it might be somebody else, but there's a sense of the collective there that you're at large exchanging with. The concept of the gift economy is something I'm more, more than I'd imagine I would have been familiar with since working on this project for two years. And there's a lot of amazing sociological, psychological research that looks at the positive effects that gift economies can have and how they've operated in the past and arguably still in the present. But when I thought of the idea two and a half years ago, I had never heard of the phrase gift economy. For me, it was just a natural extension of life as I often experienced it with friends, family, and strangers, and the parts of life that I most value and enjoy. And it's an interesting fact I'll give you now that you're all complicit in being in a gift culture constantly. Think of the last thing that somebody did for you for free. Think of the last time you did something for somebody else for free. I don't know how long I have to give you to remember. <laughs> um, now I want you to think about all the things we do in this country related to money, the GDP. Think of every shop on every high street. Think of every bank. Think of the National Health Service, the railways. Which of those two hypothetical ideas do you imagine would be bigger? There's a team at Downing Street called the Behavioral Insights Team, and the head of it, David Halpin, says that if you were to put a figure on the amount of things people in the UK today do for free for one another, it's already bigger than GDP. So it's already happening. I feel like I don't have to defend the idea as possible. What we're looking to do with Impossible is to try and make it uh, easier to see, easier to catalyze in these incredibly big, complex societies we've built around us. So, historically, in local communities, it might be very clear what the behavioral dynamics are. It might be clear who's giving to who. There's a kind of implicit mathematics going on that makes the community run. And arguably, that's much harder to construct in contemporary society. In London, apparently, the average person knows one neighbor. Um, what we're hoping with Impossible we can do is try and bring those relationships of community a little bit more to the surface in bigger societies. And um, we're designing a social network with the implicit desire to do that. One of our um, advisors to this project, Jimmy Wales, has built the largest gift economy known on this planet, Wikipedia. And um, he likes to say there are three ways you can manipulate, <laughs> manipulate, motivate human beings to do things for you. One is coercion, force, one is exchange, and one is gifting. Now, if we take the two voluntary ideas there, exchange and gifting, it strikes me that exchange, we've done a phenomenally good job of mapping out exchange dynamics. Socially, we've moved from shells, salt, cattle, cows, different things that were exchanged historically, to money, a very brilliant, a universal system by which we can measure and track and enable, therefore, exchange. I have nothing against it. I think it's a brilliant kind of uh, invention of the, of the human collective. But gifting hasn't had any kind of, or has had very little mapping. In fact, a lot of the words and ideas around gifting is often related to money and the idea of giving money. And. Um, as I said, this isn't a problem in small communities, but potentially is a problem in bigger communities. And so what Impossible hopes to do is to be one bridge in that gap we see. And hopefully there'll be many more, and hopefully many of the people in this room and who've been talking over the last two days are all part of this effort to try and build those bridges. Now, the other point I was gonna make is that I've been calling it a gift economy, um, and that's what a lot of the a lot of the understanding around this concept theoretically is. But actually, I was reading last year uh, one of the posts for Burning Man, I don't know if you know the festival in the summer, and they had a whole defense of why it should be called a gift culture, not a gift economy, and it stayed with me. 
Gift culture implies that it's not transactional, and this isn't about transactions. It implies, I think, instead an approach to life and an idea of values. And a discussion of values, I think, is at the heart of what we're trying to engender in Impossible. We're hoping that we can create a space where the values are placed on relationships, on experiences, on fundamentally people and other people, and doing the things you love, and doing them because you enjoy them and you want to enjoy life too, rather than monetary value superseding. And that's the kind of space we're defining. I feel like I've been living in a gift culture all my life. Very, um, I'm very conscious of it. And as I said, the idea for the project came off my experiences with people around me and seeing those dynamics and how, how much I valued them and wanting to extend that network of what I feel like my community is wider. Um, the project of actually doing Impossible has been the most amazing proof of concept along those lines because I feel so much richer in terms of this richness, in terms of the human connection and value and support that I did two years ago. Coming to people over the last two years with this idea has, I, I, it's hard for me to even put into words the responses I've met and the generosity I've met along the way. I came out of university two years ago and I had no experience, re, no experience whatsoever of technology and had had no previous thought of ever entering that realm. It was like, walking into China, not speaking Chinese. And I would speak to people I met, and anybody from the first guy I met who works at a branding company, who's now one of our core advisors, to the next to the next, tell them the idea and meet amazingly positive, receptive responses and built around me a kind of um, a crew, basically, on a ship. Um, and it's really been life-affirming and affirming of what this idea is about. And so if all else fails, it's been a really wonderful experience for me, <laughs> seeing the best sides of human nature. One of those people is a guy called Kwame, and I'd like to bring him on stage in a minute. I'm going to embarrass him before he comes in by telling his story quickly. Um, I had, by last summer, developed the concept quite a lot, but had had a complete disaster when it came to development. I'd gone through two different agencies to try and build it. Both times it hadn't worked. And I thought, OK, I'm third time round. I'm going to try one more time, and then I'm going to give up. And so last summer, I was meeting different people that I could potentially build with individuals, investors, agencies. And one of them was this man, Kwame. And I spoke to him about the project. He kind of gave me initially a bit of a grilling. Uh, was this a PR thing? Was I trying to seem really nice? I think I passed that test. <laughs> um, and uh, we continued the conversation about the project. He was really interested. Um, and then the next week, I went to Bangladesh. I'd met Professor Mohammed Yunus at the beginning of last year, and I'd been trying to work out what the monetary structure was going to be that this gift economy would sit within. There's a potential for an inherent paradox there. You're creating a space that's not about money, but essentially, in our day and age, you have to have money to build it, to pay developers, to run it, and it has the potential to make money. And I was trying to work out how to not create an inherent paradox. And so I was very inspired by Yunus's model of social business. I went to Bangladesh, studied it further, looked at his businesses in practice, and knew in my heart that was the right thing to do for the project, but thought that that was probably the most uh, alienating thing to tell any investor, and it might see them run a mile. And so I came back, met Kwame again, Sunday afternoon in my apartment, spent about two hours talking about the project in general terms, before I kind of casually slipped in at the end, oh, and by the way, I'm thinking about making it a social business. Uh, here, here's a pamphlet. <laughs> essentially, that means you won't be able to take dividends from it, and it's not, it's not about making money, essentially. Um, a week later, he came back, back in my apartment at my, at my table, and he said, we're building it. I went, whoa, 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 but we haven't agreed anything yet. And I, it was, he was jumping. <laughs> um, he was like, no, I took a long, hard look at myself in the mirror, and I decided I have to do this as a gift. And, um, and that's, the, that's what I had to do. He's been doing it ever since. Um, and that's one example of many of the people who've contributed into this project again and again. And so I thought it was only appropriate to bring him on, and he's been involved for the last year and knows a lot of the technical side and the, the, the struggles and the journey we've had um, on that side of the equation. On cue. He said if I called him amazing, he'd leave the room. So he's a very ordinary man who does amazing things. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. <laughs> Thank you.
And I want to ask a question. I'll get to that in a second. I just want to ask a quick question, because I've never asked this. Um, and I thought it might be interesting to know why, why last summer you decided to do that. Um, I, I thought the idea was completely crazy. Uh, I, but I also thought it was an idea that, um, that is inevitable, that someone somehow, somewhere, uh, will will do it, and I think I think the time is now. Um, I thought to myself, I can do it. I have loads of developers. I invest in this in this area. Why not? Uh, and and uh, I haven't regretted uh, that as of uh, yet. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't supposed to be here. Apart from that, uh, I, uh, everything has been this running. This is the first moment smoothly. of regret after I told him two hours ago that he had to come correct. on stage. Correct. <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk through a little bit about the product. Product. Sorry. Um, I'll say that we beat us off. Launched it in Cambridge two weeks ago. So it's in the App Store, but it's closed to that community. And so this is the first time we're showing it publicly. Um, up until last summer, I was working on concept quite a lot. And I'd say the whole project has evolved as a kind of uh, sculpture, in a way, in my mind, that I've, through millions of conversations with lots of different people, I've bit piece by piece managed to find solutions for different aspects of it and problems. And at this stage, we're probably 50% there. I'd say now we're, I'd say 70, but we might be 2% there. Who knows? Um, one of the first things I was trying to work out conceptually was how to do matching. So the idea is you're using technology to show points of contact and opportunity for people to help one another. And I really didn't want it to become this kind of boring bureaucratic um, listing service of skills. I just personally probably would get put off by that, and it wasn't inspiring to me. And I also started to think through the idea of demand and being demanding. And if I was on the platform offering to teach them, teaching English on the platform, how it would feel if 10 people came and asked me for English lessons, well, I'd probably have to say no to eight or nine of them. They'd feel rejected. I'd feel guilty. And I was thinking through the different, different ways these could play out. And the concept of wishing um, kind of came through that process. And I really like the idea of wishing. I think that it's, it's something that's kind of universal language. We have trees, ponds, walls all around the world that put forward this idea of the wish. I think it's non-expectational. I wish for things. Often they come true, and sometimes they don't. I don't think there's an implicit expectation, but there's kind of hope with it. And um, fundamentally, also, it inverts the relationship whereby I'm not asking somebody to help me. Rather, I'm putting a wish into the ecosystem that then Impossible can show to people most likely to be able to help. And if somebody picks up, it will be a delightful surprise. Does that make sense, the inversion in that logic? So that's one part of the structure. We, you, you kind of change the language. It doesn't have to be wishing, but that's how we put it first and foremost. And then we used free text and hashtagging to match that against what people say they can do on Impossible. And then the other side of the equation, which was uh, harder to find, was how can we make a system that reflects what's going on so that it, hopefully it can become self-regulating. If I'm really, really generous on Impossible, hopefully somebody does something nice for me, without making it collapse into a currency uh, that has value, scarcity, all the structures inherent, obviously, in exchange paradigms, which we're trying to uh, be distinct from. And that was really hard. That was really, really hard to work out. The solution, actually, I think is very simple, but it took a while to come to. I like the idea of an abundant currency, a currency you could only ever earn that would reflect what was happening, but didn't have the um, other aspects I just mentioned. And then we decided to call that thank you and saying thank you. So the system becomes as simple as wishing, saying thank you. And then in our uh, design, we link the two concepts. I kept saying to the guys helping me with the design, um, including a friend of mine, I really want it to have a circle in it. I, had this con I really want it to represent the idea of wishing and thanking being related and the circular motion. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. And then eventually, a good friend of mine, Pete, said, well, why don't you just put them on two sides of the same coin? And so that's what we do. A simple tool that I think hopefully communicates that you wish for something, it gets answered, it gets flipped over, crossed out, and a thank you on the back. And then you can also say thank you randomly, because I love the idea of people just saying thank you more often and how that could potentially 
wind its way into other platforms and other spaces. All right. So that was challenge number one. Uh, I think that, that really was last summer. I, myself and, and the team saw this and, OK, there's something quite, quite beautiful here and a wish that becomes a thank you, right? Um, a few, uh, there are a couple of other challenges that I'd like to just briefly allude to, and you're welcome to come and talk to us at the end of this. Um, so the, the first one is there are so many social networks out there. How can we utilize their mechanisms? How can we utilize their, their power um, in, in, within um, impossible? Um, we, at first, we decided, oh, let's, let's, you know, people have to invite each other because otherwise uh, this is, you know, we're going to run into privacy issues. Um, and eventually, um, by meeting someone, someone amazing in, in, in San Francisco, we, we, uh, we decided, let's go, let's go with the follow model. So the follow model became a big turning point in this social network. So that's what we have. We have content that's very um, geo-relevant. So um, as Lily was alluding to, it's, it is about communities. Um, you don't know your neighbors. Um, how can you connect with people around you if the wishes are in, you know, in San Francisco? There might be wishes that you can fulfill around you right now. Um, so uh, geo-relevant content is definitely uh, very important for us. Uh, the, whole privacy, um, uh, the whole privacy debate, we're still, we're still talking about it. We are trialing this in, in, in Cambridge right now. We're trialing this internally. And we're st we want to see if... Um, by, by having users come forth and say, I can actually do this or I can do that, um, um, what, what are the implications? You know, if my mom sees that I can uh, help someone um, dress up as a transvestite, um, is, you know, is, do I want that to be public or not? Uh, could be a wish that I have for some reason that came up now. <laughs> um, <laughs> And again, the, the, the abundance of, of the thank yous, right? So thank yous are very, uh, they are the currency. They're infinite. You can have as many as you, as you can earn, right? <laughs> as you can earn, yeah. <laughs> um, so the third challenge is Lily. Um, <laughs> I am, uh, as many of you, uh, a fellow geek. Um, Lily comes from a different uh, atmosphere, a different world. Um, and... Uh, she wakes up in the morning and, you know, the tweet is, I wish, therefore I can, right? <laughs> um, and the team needs to huddle uh, and kind of go, okay, what's the wish now? Uh, how can we make this wish real, right? Um, and, and so we have to prioritize features um, and we, we've developed our own internal process and it's, we work in triangles, so we do the user experience, we do the UI, um, we code it very quickly, we test it, we validate it. Is it adding value to the user? If not, ditch it. If it's not yet there, go back to UX, UI. UX it eventually becomes UI. Um, and then goes back to coding, and coding becomes production code. Um, it's, it has been a challenge, but uh, a lovely one nonetheless. Um, so this is... This is the application that uh, you will be able to download. You can already download it. It's very hidden away in the App Store. Um, because, as I said, uh, we are trialing this in Cambridge. It's not yet fully public, but we're, we welcome your, um, your, uh, your feedback. If you come back to us, we'll, we'll get you an invite. So the whole idea behind it is you have a stream of wishes and thank yous. Um, it's fairly, fairly simple and quite beautiful. The identity is very linked to uh, Lily's aesthetical um, prowess, I would say. Um, a wish becomes a conversation. So uh, wishes are not just little tweets. They need to become conversations, and people need to commit to it. One thing we've learned is if we put a commit button, it really, it really works. People kind of, oh, he's committed to my wish. OK, let's talk, uh, you know. Um, if there is, in the beginning, there wasn't that commit button, and we were like, oh, uh, and I just thought people are so like commitment phobes. Exactly. So <laughs> the commit button is a, commit a big button. one, um, and 
yes, the wishes are conversations. And the thank yous, the, this, this currency, we start with very simple thank yous. You take a picture of, you know, you can, you, can, uh, you can tattoo a thank you and take a picture. You can write something down and just say, thank you very much for, uh, for helping me uh, with, my, um, with my math test and so forth and so forth. But it is, it really is about taking pictures and, and being elegant at it. Uh, we're open to more suggestions as to how we could actually, what the thank you could be. Um, we're obviously, we're looking at video, so don't tell us video. Or we're looking at, you know, leaving a little voicemail. Leaving, how can we empower people to thank each other? And we want thank yous to really become a currency here, right? Um, it's actually curious to say, I was going to say, in Cambridge, uh, where we've been testing it, one, I put up a wish when I, was, I went to do an installation there two weeks ago. I wished for a, a blanket for the day because we realized very late that we didn't have any. Two boys in conversation had a whole dialogue with me about lending me a bank blanket. Came, lent them to me for the day. I thanked them. It works. Um, and it was actually really an amazing feeling to see work. Um, but we've also noticed in Cambridge that people take photographs of themselves to say thank you. You can read into that however you will. <laughs> I don't know what to make of that you, yet. You see it up on the screen. People start taking pictures of themselves too thank each other, which is a bit odd. Uh, some things oh, you nice. will never know. We need to test, and that's what we're doing. We're testing right now. Um, and this is, this is where we are. We have an app um, that's in private beta, um, which we will open up during the summer um, with, hopefully, your feedback. We have a website that's running in parallel. We're doing the Android um, version at the same time. And uh, finally, I just want to say, in the last two years, I've been incredibly inspired and excited by the opportunity I see with the internet to kind of have not only new social paradigms, I mean, that's obvious to say, but multiple social paradigms coexisting. And um, my old politics history teacher came to my house the year ago, and I'd just done my first version of wireframes. They were paper. And um, he looked at it, and he's amazing man. He's retired now, 40 years of his life studying history and teaching politics. And he was really blown away to look at it because he was like, not by the idea singularly, but just by the potential he suddenly recognized the internet to offer people, to offer ideas that people for hundreds of years have been potentially trying to employ um, that have never been possible or manageable nowadays. And I see that with a lot of the other entrepreneurs I meet and the the companies you see and the whole rise of the sharing economy is hugely exciting, I think, because I feel like there's a sense of empowerment implicit in it that empowers people to design new systems, but also to allow systems to coexist so that individuals have choices to make. And rather than having to subscribe to one system by a top-down country, government, whatever you want to understand that structure as, I feel like there's a multiplicity of possibilities now that you can be part of a gift culture, you can be part of a monetary system, and the two don't seem to have to be at odds. And we'd love any, uh, anyone here uh, who's involved in this kind of movement, I'd say, of the sharing economy, we'd love to have you involved. If you want to be part of our beta, come and speak to us afterwards. If you have questions, come and speak to us. And our whole ethos is collaboration. So that's the They told us we couldn't have modus. a phone here. Otherwise, I would, we would thank people. Great. <laughs> thank you right away. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much.